Hello, welcome to part two of the video series on sword dynamics. I'm Thomas from Medieval Review, and in the last video we talked about uh, kind of the history, a little bit of the history behind the sword dynamics, who's kind of worked on it, uh, specifically Vincent Le Chevalier and Peter Johnson, some of my own interactions with it, and we also took a look at what the sword agility graphs actually show, what the properties, both dynamic properties of the sword as well as physical properties of the sword, what they are, what they mean in kind of a general way to find them. In this video, we're going to talk about how to take more scientifically accurate measurements of the physical properties of the sword that are necessary in order to build the agility graph. So before we start that, I wanted to make a general note that of course I am using the Albion Lichtenauer Blunt Long Sword, and the way I'm handling this sword is like a blunt sword. Uh, generally speaking, when I handle any sword, blunt or not, I always treat it like it's sharp. Uh, however, for the sake of being able to maneuver for this video, I'm just going to treat it like a blunt sword. Uh, if you are doing any of these measurements with a sharp sword, please uh, take extra precautions to keep yourself safe because we are holding the sword sometimes in a non-traditional manner and we are, of course, um, going to be working around the blade a good bit. So you want to make sure that you're very, very careful when you're using this uh, as a sharp sword or you're using a sharp sword to take these measurements. Um, in general, uh, it's really easy to do a lot of these measurements, although um, certain aspects can be hard to get skilled at doing. Uh, thankfully, Vincent's tool, his Sword Dynamics computer, is actually uh, forgiving of that. He actually has some confidence ratios you can put in there. Um, certainly, you should read the documentation he's written for the tool as well. Uh, but I'm going to go over exactly how we're going to take those measurements. So let's take a look. To get a very good agility graph, of course, you need to make sure that you have all the right tools to take very exacting measurements. So many aspects of building these agility graphs and pulling in the information, unfortunately, is very hard to replicate scientifically. Things like the waggle test are uh, methodologies you have to end up using, but there are ways to make it more accurate. And to do this, you need a good set of tools to work with. Now, thankfully, these tools are generally readily available, so you should be able to find them pretty easy and build your kit to test and weigh and all that type of stuff. So to begin with, I just want to go over the tools. Uh, the first thing you need is a good ruler. It needs to be a metric ruler. That is, you need to be able to get things in centimeters. Uh, if you are based on the imperial system, such as the US, uh, you might have to go somewhere to find a really, really good metric ruler. And I'd also recommend getting the longest one you can find. Um, this one I have only goes up to 76 centimeters. That's actually not super great because swords are obviously much longer than 76 centimeters. And if you can get one that goes well over 100 centimeters, uh, that's more ideal. Specifically, this uh, sword in front of me goes really, really quite long. It goes to uh, just over 120 centimeters at the end of the day. Um, so. The less you have to move the ruler, the better. However, um, I have tips and tricks for that as well. Uh, but yeah, get yourself a good metric ruler. The next item you need to make sure you have are some hair ties. Uh, hair ties are a little bit strange. Uh, you might be wondering why. Well, you can actually use rubber bands as well. Uh, but I would suggest really high quality hair ties because you're going to use these, as you will see in a bit, you're going to use these to actually find the pivot points and the vibration nodes. And it, their ability to assist you in doing so is invaluable. And the reason you want strong ones, especially if you're using a sharp sword, is you need to be able to put them on the blade without them getting cut or breaking too easily. Uh, so I suggest really, really nice, robust hair ties. Uh, the next item you need is a triangular little block, a little stand on which to balance the sword. This is necessary to find the center of mass as accurately as possible. You can find the center of mass by balancing on your finger, but honestly, your finger represents a larger surface. You want to reduce that surface down as much as possible. Now you can actually get a form of a triangular box uh, in certain candy bars, but the problem with this is that it actually crushes really easily, um, even with the chocolate inside. So I discard that and I made my own uh, cardboard uh, box, little triangular box that I can set the sword on and it holds it really well. It's very, very sturdy. 
Uh, the final item you need is a good digital scale. I would suggest a kitchen scale. Um, again, it needs to be able to do metric. Everything we're going to do is in metric. The Imperial system does not really work well uh, for ga gathering these measurements and for the way they interact with each other. Um, so make sure you can do things in grams. Uh, so a good kitchen scale, scale works for that. Most kitchen scales can go upwards of about five kilograms, and that's more than enough. It'd be very rare for you to come across a sword that weighs more than that, that's actually useful. Um, and as long as it can give you good accurate to the gram measurements, it's the type of scale you can use. I also use uh, my balance sword stand. I uh, take these measurements, I make sure that I zero out the scale. And what this actually allows me to do is it allows me uh, to keep the sword above everything so I know all the weight of the sword is going onto the scale and I'm not having it resting on anything that I'm unaware of. Uh, so those are the tools you need to take these accurate measurements. Now let's take a look at how you take these measurements individually. So the first thing we're going to measure is actually just the overall length of the sword and understanding uh, the length of both the hilt and the blade portions of it. Um, so I will note that uh, because I have a small ruler, it's really hard uh, to get accurate measurements. I have to move that ruler. So I use this as a little trick. I get a little sticky pad. I write a little arrow on it. That way when I have to move this ruler, I can just set it down to mark where my last measurement location was. But we'll just go through this process on this sword right now and get the overall length of these individual components. I will also note that uh, the order of items that you will come across uh, going from pommel to tip, and that's the way we're going to do the measurements. The pommel, uh, the very edge of the pommel is 0 0.0, so zero centimeters. Uh, in order, you will probably discover the uh, pivot point for the leverage point. You'll find the vibration node in the handle. You will find the pivot point just behind the cross. You will get the measurement of the cross guard itself. On the blade, you will find the center of mass, followed by the uh, pivot point associated to the leverage point on the hilt. You will then find the vibration node in the blade, followed finally by the pivot point associated with the forward uh, pivot point on the hilt. But I like to do those things in stages, and the very first thing I like to do is just get overall measurements of the sword itself. So I'm going to uh, place this ruler right here just over the pommel, and what I'm going to find is that the rough location of the cross guard looks like is 27.5 centimeters. So I would write that down, 27.5. And also I will note that because I'm about to then do a secondary measurement from the cross to, to the blade, um, I'm going to set that little sticky note right there. That's where I'm going to now begin my measurement for the overall uh, length of the blade. So the blade going from the middle of the cross all the way to the tip. So when I set the ruler down there and I set all this down, what I find is, well, I've run out of ruler space. I've gotten to 76 centimeters over here. I'm gonna shift this down a bit. Um, so I get to 76 centimeters. So I'm just gonna move my sticky note onto the blade and I'm going to get the final measurement here. Um, and that gets me to, it looks like uh, 17 centimeters. So I know that the overall length of the blade is 76 plus 17. That gives me an overall blade length of 93 centimeters. And I can add that to the hilt length of 27.5 and I get an overall sword length of 120.5 centimeters. So you write that down. That's the overall length of the sword, the length of the hilt, and the length of the blade. Next, we're gonna find those rotational pivot points. I find it's actually easiest to find the rotational pivot points by standing up, so I'm going to do that, and I'm going to mainly focus on what happens with the blade as I pivot it. But of course, we need our trusty tools. I'm going to grab some hair bands. So the way this is going to work is I'm going to place one of these hair bands right here over, over uh, my cross guard or right next to where I'm going to actually be holding it. Right about there, about a centimeter back, like I said. And I'll actually be gripping it by around that hair band. Um, and then what I will do is I will hold this blade uh, by that point and I will start doing that waggle test. Um, but I'm going to also now set this hair band right here on the blade 
and bring it up a bit, and I'm going to do the waggle test. And what I'll see is, oh, that was a pretty good first guess, actually. Uh, it's moving a little bit, so I'm going to move it up a bit. Oh, maybe down a bit. seems to, of course, again, hold lightly and begin to move it as best as possible. So I think that's roughly a good spot for it. Um, right there, maybe a little bit higher. It's, it's very hard to find. It takes a little bit of while to kind of hone in on it and find just the right location. When you move it, what you'll find is that the hairband won't really move all that much. See, that moves a lot. So let's see here. Okay, one more time. Okay, so right about there is where I want to get the location for that point on my blade. Um, so I have these associated pairs, and uh, what I'm going to now do is I'm going to take the measurements uh, from these points, again, basically from zero. Um, so I'm going to go from zero to that point. That looks like it's about 25 centimeters. Um, and then, uh, so 25 centimeters in is the location of uh, the, the forward pivot point and the grip. And then knowing that I'm going to start basically in 27.5, uh, I get to 62, or sorry, 61.5. Likewise, I can now take the similar measurements for the waggle test going now to uh, this upper part of the blade, uh, the leverage point here. So I'm going to grab it now by the leverage point, um, roughly, and I'm going to just begin the waggle test. I'm actually gonna hold that up a bit. All right, and I'm going to begin the waggle test, and you can see this is going to have to come much higher up on the blade. Now I just slid that up. If you're using a sharp sword, you'd cut it by doing that. A little bit higher. And again, if you're doing this well, um, hopefully you won't actually see this, the middle part of this band move too much. And so you just gotta kinda hone in on it, move it around till you think you found it. I think I found it right there. It's good enough for the purposes of demonstration. Um, and of course you wanna spend time trying to get as accurate measurements as possible. So again, I will do uh, the measurements to the points I was holding it at. From the pommel, it looks like it is six centimeters exactly to uh, the, this end right here, to the uh, leverage point. And then again, from the middle of the cross guard where I've been taking these measurements, it looks like it is exactly 25 centimeters to the associated point. So six centimeters in, and then this is 25 plus again, 27.5. Similarly, now I will use the same method for finding uh, what is essentially the vibration nose. I'm going to hold the sword, I'm just going to hit it, and I'm going to try to move that hairband where I think it needs to go. A little bit back, a little bit this way. So you can see now in the video, hopefully it's at least a little bit clear, there's roughly a place where it isn't oscillating very much, uh, and that's the location on the blade. Likewise, I need to find the location on the handle. I'm thinking it's gonna be right about here. We're gonna find out though. A little bit in. No, back a bit. All right, so right about here in the handle is where I have that associated uh, vibration node. And again, the exact same way to do the measurements for this. I'm going to start from point zero. I get 18 centimeters. And then from that point on the hilt, I get 57.5. So again, that is 18 and 57.5 on the blade plus the 27.5 that you get from the hilt. Now we've gotten all those measurements of the hair bands. The hair bands can go get the sword back to normal. And then the very last thing we need to do is actually get the measurement of the center of mass. And this takes a lot of while to hone in on because I gotta set it down right here on this triangular block and I try to find the point where it balances. 
It's rocking a bit back towards the pommel. So I'm going to just barely shift it towards the blade. Now it's a bit blade heavy, so I shift it just a bit back. Almost there. All right, and there we go. It is perfectly balanced on this block. Now, um, this is actually where I bring back the sticky note because I like to just set it right on that point. That makes it a little bit easier for me to now measure this. Um, so I'm going to set this again at zero. And what I find is getting to 38.25 centimeters. And that's 38.25 centimeters in total um, from the pommel to that uh, central point, that center of mass. So now I've actually gathered all the information I need to enter into the tool. So we're gonna do that next, see what happens when we enter in the information. So this is the Weapon Dynamics computer as written by Vincent Le Chevalier. And uh, it's a big blank page. We're gonna be filling it out. And as we do so, you will actually see the graph being drawn out. Uh, now, one thing I do want to note before we begin entering in the information is that not all of my measurements are gonna be entirely accurate. Uh, certainly up to this point, my main focus in this entire video is of course making the video, making sure everything's on screen and doing the presentation. And that actually distracts me a bit from taking the most accurate information. However, it should be accurate enough for demonstration here. Uh, so as we sit down, as we're ready to fill this out, uh, we should have everything written down. Uh, and I like to go ahead and fill it out entirely. And as we go through this, I'll also talk about some of the other features that this tool provides. So uh, first off, there we go. It's the Albion Lichtenauer. Uh, our mass we got was 1,614 grams. The hilt extremity, that is the pommel, that's a big whopping zero. Uh, it is worth knowing that there are some swords where maybe the hilt extremity is not actually zero. There are some cases of that. Uh, certain types of peen blocks uh, might actually make some variations. I, I certainly, as I've looked through the book, uh, the sword form and thought, you actually see some examples of that. But for the most part, hilt extremity will probably be at a zero. Our grip reference point, as we were calling it, generally speaking, our cross guard. Now, I was measuring to the center of the cross guard. Don't always have to. Uh, we had that at 27.5 centimeters. The blade extremity, uh, which was the very tip of the blade, was at 120.5 centimeters. The center of gravity, uh, we had at 38.25 centimeters. And our lever reference point, which was right there near the end of the, or right as the pommel uh, piece met the grip, was at six centimeters. The hilt node, now this is the vibration node, was 18 centimeters in, and the blade portion of that vibration node was at 85 centimeters. Now, underneath here, we now have, uh, I'm trying to highlight it, uh, pivot points that we're going to be adding and we can add as many pivot points as we would like we're only going to be doing two and I'm leaving the confidence as one although I think technically maybe it's not as high on either of these um, but uh, if you look over the documentation for this tool the confidence is relative so if I set both of these at low confidence at like a two or three each um, it won't really weigh out any differently so I'm just gonna leave them as one we'll see it for the example but the action point this is where we were holding it as we were doing the pivot uh, the initial one was at 24.5 this was a just below the grip reference, uh, grip, re grip reference being right at the cross guard. And then, um, of course, we were a little bit below that, more than a centimeter in this case uh, overall. Uh, and then where on the blade that actually pivoted around, we measured that at 89 centimeters when it was all said and done. And you can see immediately is now filled out a good bit of this graph. Um, this is not the full amount of this graph. Uh, we still have yet another pivot point to put in there, but you can see that all you really need to do is take one and you'll at least get some information. Uh, and I'll talk a bit about what all these symbols mean in a moment. Uh, the very last thing we have to add is, well, we did a pivot point right there at the lever reference actually, and it was at 52.5 centimeters on the blade that that appeared, and there you go. 
So that is our full graph. And you can see oh, there are all sorts of information on the screen over here under computed data, et cetera, et cetera. And some of this is actually theoretical uh, concepts. Um, so it actually builds out some theoretical points. I'll note what some of those are. Uh, these red vertical lines, um, these are actually theoretical points. Uh, but our actual measured were here in the circle in the circled spots So this actually tells us that well, maybe we're off of where the theoretical is keep in mind theoretical is theoretical and Practical is what we could practically measure or at least our best ability the truth lies probably somewhere in between the two um, But uh, the theoretical could be pretty darn accurate sometimes. Uh, it really just depends um, as you can see uh, as I'm circling it here uh, there is, of course, um, the pivot point that we did. This is our action point number one, and here is its corresponding uh, pivot on the blade. And then here it is, the lever reference, and here it is on the blade. And actually, I should be circling the circle, not the, the line, obviously. Um, this is, of course, location of our cross. This dotted line is the location of where we held the action point. Um, and here is the associated vibration node. Now this becomes a little bit confusing. So this is the vibration node in the blade, but this vertical dotted line is the vibration node in the hilt. It's a little bit confusing. Uh, what matters is we'll, we'll take some of this information when we build the final chart, uh, which will happen in the next video. We'll take this information and we'll build a nice pretty chart that looks just like what was in the book, The Sword, Form, and Thought. It is worth noting that what you see in The Sword, Form, and Thought uh, is actually a little bit different. This chart actually gives you more information, um, but it's not nearly as pretty. Uh, so certainly this is really good information. Now what's really cool about this, there's a couple features. You can save the drawing. This will just download it as an SVG, as a vector file, uh, which we're going to actually utilize. So I'm gonna go ahead and click that and download that. Um, and then uh, you can see there's some options here, permalink to this weapon. What that does, if you were to click that, it'll actually bring you a link you can copy. And copying this link will actually bring up a brand new um, page with this information on it. So you can share the link directly to anyone and actually bring up this chart. You can also save this weapon. Um, in doing so, it actually saves it to a JSON uh, file, which is js.json. That is a file that can be, it's basically just a data file that can be loaded back in. You can also create a database here. Um, so I can add this uh, to the database. Here's my database. If I were to add new weapons, I could continually do a new weapon. If I were to click new, it'd, it'd refresh and I can also remove things. I can save this database as well. Saving that is also going to go to a JSON file, a .json. Again, it's just a big data file. What's cool about this is that you can share your database with other people. You can update your database, etc. This is something I'm going to look into doing so people can actually directly reference my um, dynamics information. And this could also be a very useful way for uh, manufacturers to actually build a catalog of what they have done in terms of dynamic uh, computations. Um, you can, of course, then choose uh, files to import, to merge, etc. So if you actually, people are sharing databases with you, you can actually merge them into your own database and build an even bigger one. Uh, none of this process is actually allowing for uh, a shared database globally. Um, that is not really within the intent of what Vincent wanted to do. I'm sure someone can maybe come up with a way to do that. Uh, the other thing to note about this entire tool is that it runs on your browser. After it does the initial load, it does not share any information with a server. So everything that's here is here. It only saves if you intend to save it. Uh, there's other some, uh, other some options here. Uh, diagram options you can scale to constant lengths um, I leave it where it is um, I think this is a pretty accurate view of what the overall sword shape will look like and we'll, we'll make notes of that in the next video as well and again you have computed uh, data over here this is not necessarily always based on full physical measurements although you can see that we're getting accurate blade lengths etc so there you go this is the computational chart that we got this is our agility chart I'll actually show you real quick I actually have uh, an example of uh, the old data I took for the Lichtenauer. This was uh, prior to getting better at this. And you can see uh, here it's actually a little bit different. So kind of jumping back and forth between the two. Uh, I actually think the information we took 
uh, in this video is actually more accurate and I'm sure if I refined, uh, so this is the, the old measurements, if I refined this, I'm my process, I'm sure I'd have it even better than uh, both of these. But as it stands, this is the one for the example we've done in the video. And in the next video, I'll be showing you how to take this agility chart, take the uh, vector program, throw it into a program called Inkscape, and we're going to build an absolutely beautiful and publishable uh, agility chart that looks really professional. So stay tuned for the next video. Don't forget to like the video and subscribe to the channel. You can also check out Medieval Review on Patreon.